Like, like, what am I supposed to say after that? Can you put your hands together for the creative team here at Church by the Place? <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Is there anybody who loves their mom in the building this weekend? Can you make some noise? My mom's in the room. Mom, I love you so much. Happy Mother's Day. Despite what anybody posts on Instagram tomorrow, you are the greatest mom in the world. I love you so much. For those that may not know who I am, my name is Pastor Charlie Hughes. I lead the young adult movement of this church called Rally. So uh, if you're between the ages of 18 to 30, I hope you come rally with us at the end of this month. But I'm excited for today. This is our last week of our series, Fearless Family. Has anybody enjoyed this series so far? Can you make some noise? And this is the finale, Mother's Day weekend. No pressure, I'm excited. I believe God has a word for us and I think something special is about to go down. Is anybody ready for the word of God? I got a question. Uh, is there anybody under the sound of my voice this weekend who would say that there is a particular phrase or saying that you use more than the average person. Is there anybody? Like, is there, any, is there any phrase or saying that maybe people would associate you with, you use it that much? Anybody, make some noise, raise your hand. Who am I talking to? A few of you. My guess is, I haven't taken a survey or a poll room or anything like that, but there's probably some, some guys in here and you use what I like to call brotations, meaning you start and end every sentence with the word bro. Bro. That's good, bro, looking swole, bro. Bro, we going Chipotle after church today, bro? Bro. Any bros in the room? Any bros in the room? And I know it's Mother's Day, but my guess is that there, there's some of you who are a little bit more like my dad, and you're what I would call a circumstantial, situational phrase saying user. Like, I love my dad, but I know that if there's certain situations, if I were to drop him into there's only so many things that are gonna come out of his mouth. He's like a toy with a string in the back. Like there's only so many things he's gonna say. For example, if I'm wearing a little bit of cologne, like an appropriate amount of cologne, and then I go up and give my dad a hug, I'm telling you, what my dad is going to say is, Charlie, you smell good. But you know, you never wanna be that guy who wears too much cologne. Are there any situational, circumstantial phrase saying users like my dad? A few of you. If there is any one saying or phrase that I use more than the average person is probably the, the saying, the phrase, for lack of a better word. I use this saying when I don't really know how to say what it is I'm thinking that and that I wish I could say in fewer words. So I'll get into a long-winded explanation of whatever it is I'm thinking by first saying, for lack of a better word. I'm not going to take a long time, I'm not gonna be long-winded today, but the title of this sermon is, For Lack of a Better Word. I wanna preach out of the book of 2 Kings. We're gonna be in chapter four, and I thought this was an appropriate text for this Mother's Day weekend because it's actually a story about a mom, a widow actually, who has a debt that her husband left her with to pay, and she has to go to some pretty drastic lengths in order to keep her sons from being sold into slavery. Second Kings chapter four, verse one reads this. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elijah, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know, he revered the Lord. But now his creditor, is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all of your neighbors for some empty jars, but don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. So verse five, she left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, mom, there is not a jar left. Then, then, somebody say, then. Yeah. Then the oil stopped flowing. 
She went and told the man of God what had happened. And he said to her, go and sell the oil and pay your debts. And you and your sons can live on what is left. Can you make some noise for the word of God? Notice the prophet Elisha did not tell this woman how many jars of oil to fill. He did not give her every detail. He did not tell her how things would end when she began. He just told her to start pouring. And to this woman's credit, without reservation and without hesitation and lack of a better word that she would have liked or preferred, she chose to act on the last thing God said. We've all been told enough to obey God today. When God speaks, God does not make suggestions. He gives instructions. So when in scripture, God tells you and I to do something, God is not asking for our consideration. No, but he is expecting our obedience. But yet some of us live and act as if we are waiting God to speak to us through a burning bush or in an audible voice before we do what we know in our hearts God wants us to do. And the excuse we keep making for doing nothing is, God's been silent. He hasn't spoken to me yet. Yet you sit there with your Bible closed, haven't prayed in weeks, and you are just inactive in the dialogue as you claim God is. What you call a lack of clarity is not a loophole to not do the little you already know to do. And I would argue that God has already spoken at a volume sufficient for you to be held accountable to the standard of his word. Yeah, yeah, I would actually say that God has covered his basis when it comes to his expectations for you and I in our relationship with him. James chapter 4 verse 17 says this, if any one of you then knows something good you ought to do and you don't do it, it's a sin for that person. Church by the glaze, what is understood does not need to be explained. We got to stop trying to get out of obeying God on a technicality. We love to remind ourselves that God is a man of his word when it comes to all the promises and scripture that God makes to us. But we don't like reminding ourselves that God means what he says just as much in the Bible when it comes to all that he has asked of us. It, this, this is the paradox. This is the, this, the slippery slope we, we find ourselves often, often in. Because the thing is, true faith does not search for excuses to not trust God. True faith searches for evidence and reason to trust God. Have you ever, have you ever had a friend who had feelings for somebody who you knew was on some shady stuff? Like this person that your friend had feelings for would always cancel on your friend last minute, but yet your friend would always have a reason to give this person a second, third, fourth, fifth chance. Your friend would be like, you know, you know they, I'm sure they had a long work day. Like they're probably tired. They're probably at home resting. I'm sure this is the only time they have to run errands. You know, I, I bet they're hanging with their family tonight. Family's a really big priority to them. That, that's probably why they couldn't see me tonight. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Call me crazy, but I think this is the kind of confidence, faith, and trust we should have in the God who has proven himself to actually be worthy and deserving of it. The God who has never given us any reason to start doubting him. The God who has never given us any reason to think he's gonna start failing us now. The God who has never given us any reason to think that he's gonna start now breaking his promises because up to this point, every time he said he'll show up, he has. We've gotta stop treating predictions as promises and his promises as predictions. Our future's not looking favorable from where we stand today does not have the final say about our tomorrow because the legitimacy of a promise found in scripture is not determined by the severity of your problem, but by the power vested in the authority of your God. So do not allow what in your life right now, which seems to be surrounded with so much confusion and uncertainty to steal credibility in your mind from what God has said. 
what God has said carries more weight than what you can see. And if God said it, he meant it, which means you can trust it. You can trust it. But some of you, some of you, you're not waiting on a better word. You're not waiting on a clearer piece of instruction. No, you're waiting on a word you like. Too often, even us Christian people can live as if we believe that God is only powerful enough and smart enough to help us with what we're going through as long as our belief in God will not cause us to obey God in a way that could cost us our comfort or disagree with our preference. So we'll stop believing that God knows best when it comes to our relationships when it means we have to be faithful to one person. We'll stop believing that God has the power to provide peace that this world cannot provide when it means we have to stop abusing prescription pills. We'll stop believing that God has the power to bring the right people and community into our lives when it means we first have to distance ourselves from the people who often lead us to making decisions that we regret. We will literally stop our belief in God short of any conviction that could result in uncomfortable, inconvenient, unpreferable action. But this is where we get it wrong. Because as long as we only trust God and believe in God in the ways that we find most comfortable and convenient, we're no longer just protecting our preference, but we're actually robbing ourselves of future advancement. Our refusal to obey God in ways that scares us is what becomes the roadblock to our lives improving. And yet we wonder why things don't change. After receiving this confusing, somewhat unclear, and let's be real crazy piece of instruction from the prophet Elisha, I have to think this woman wanted a different word, a better word, a word that she better liked, a word that she better preferred, a word that was more in alignment with her comfort and preference. I can assume this with a lot of confidence because before this woman even told Elisha about the little bit of oil she had, she first answered the question that Elisha had not asked her. Elisha did not ask this woman how much resource she had left. Elisha asked this woman what resource she had left. But she first started by trying to soften the blow of what she believed to be the underwhelming nature of the little resource she did have by first telling Elisha that what she had was not much. She told Elisha, I have nothing, nothing at all, absolutely nothing, except this little bit of oil. <laughs> she essentially said to Elisha, this oil is all I have. When you live with a, this is all I have mentality, it will cause you to want to protect what God has given you to put to work. And even though she didn't have much, the prophet Elisha asked her to do something radical in response to what she shared. It's important that we remember and at least give this woman this credit and this grace. What the prophet Elisha told her to do would have been just as crazy for her to do and for her to believe as it would be for us to do and for us to believe yeah. if this were happening today. Like this was not an ordinary thing during this time. Like prophets were not just handing out formulas for people to follow in order for their needs to be met. What the prophet Elisha told this woman to do would have been just as weird to her as it would be to us. The prophet Elisha was to tell you to take the last little bit of olive oil you got in your pantry, collect your neighbor's pots and pans, and pour the olive oil you got in your pantry into your neighbor's pots and pans in order for you to miraculously make your next car payment. Like that's how weird this would have been to this woman. And even though she was right, she didn't have much. This woman still minimized the little she had. I wonder, could you be overlooking the little in your life that God wants to perform a miracle through? Oh, please, don't overlook the little. Don't miss the meaning in the mundane. 
Do not lose sight of the significant and the small. Do not despise the day of humble beginnings. I like the way that Pastor Stephen Furtick, who's going to be at First Baptist this upcoming Wednesday, says it. He, he says it like this. He explains it like this. Our human philosophy, how we think it's, I'll pour more once I get more. But how it goes in God's kingdom, in God's economy is, you'll get more as you pour more. I know it sounds crazy. I know it seems scary. I know it takes faith and courage to believe. But results that make no sense are the product of obedience that makes no sense. What seems most impractical may just end up being the most impactful. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will be the product of the process of God that surpasses the logic of your situation. You will only become someone, church, by the glades, who can do all things through Christ, who can strengthen you. When you first do all the things that Christ who can strengthen you has asked you to do and I'm telling you this now so that way when the time eventually comes for you to trust God and obey God and exercise faith in God with what seems so difficult you won't be shocked you won't be surprised you won't be taken aback you won't be caught off guard discouraged or dismayed but ready to trust God with whatever it is he asks you with because whenever God asks you to trust him, whenever God asks you to believe in him, whenever God asks you to obey him, whenever God asks you to exercise faith in him in a new way, the action will always be attached to what in your life has kept you from trusting God like you need to. God will often test you before he blesses you. This way when he finally does, the blessing and fulfillment of his promise in your life will not become more of an object of worship in your life than he is. Because that would be called an idol. So in this woman's life, by asking for the little bit of oil she had left to her name, God, through Elisha, was asking this woman for everything. So that way there would be nothing in the way of her trusting him. You may be here, and in this moment, you're thinking about the little bit you have left to work with in your life. Maybe in this moment, you're thinking to yourself and even saying to God, Lord, this is all I have. I want to protect it. I don't want to put it to work. This is all I have left, to which I think God might just be saying back to you this weekend. Exactly. That's why it's all I want. Because your perspective and protection of it are is what has been keeping you from trusting me, obeying me, believing in me, exercising faith in me like you need to in order for you to experience all that I have for you. God will ask you to trust him and obey him in ways that you find difficult and painful so that way when the time comes for you to live in all that he has for you, you will always be more in love with the blesser than the blessing. Amen. Amen. What Elisha told this woman to do would have been uncomfortable, inconvenient, inconceivable, and let's just be real, uncool by every human standard of her situation. But this woman chose to obey anyway. That's a word for somebody right there. That's the reason why God brought you to church. Obey anyway. Even when it doesn't make sense. Obey anyway. Even when you don't feel like it. Obey anyway. Even when you think you know a better way. Obey anyway. Because this woman chose to obey anyway. As she poured that little bit of oil she had, it continued to flow until every last jar her sons brought her was filled. And I'm sorry, I can't help it. I'm just a curious guy. I love to ask questions as I read and study the Bible. I, I can't help but wonder. I wonder if it would have been as hard for this woman to have the faith to pour that little bit of oil she had into the last jar that was brought to her as it would have been for her to pour oil into the first jar that was brought to her. Because I know when she was brought that first empty jar 
and then looked at that little bit of oil she had to pour, it had to be one of the most painful moments of her life. It had to be one of the hardest things she had ever done up to that point. She was probably thinking to herself, this is all I have left. This makes no sense. I don't get it. God is really asking me to waste the only thing I have left to my name right now. But what other option do I have? Here goes nothing. And I just imagine as that first little bit of oil flowed into that first empty jar and it began to cover the bottom of the jar and then began to fill a quarter of the jar, then half the jar, then two thirds of the jar, then three quarters of the jar until the first jar was completely filled to the brim. I don't know about you, but I can just picture this woman's eyes widening. I can just picture a smile appearing on her face. I can see her posture and her body language changing. I can almost hear her yelling at one of her sons saying, grab me another empty jar so that way she can make a clean transfer of the oil she was pouring into the next jar without wasting a single drop. And as she was brought a second jar, a third jar, a fourth jar, a fifth jar, a sixth jar, until every last jar that was brought to her was filled, she would have kept pouring because the oil kept flowing and the jars kept filling. At a certain point, her arm probably got tired. Her arthritis was probably acting up. Her deltoid was probably burning, but she could not help but keep pouring as the oil kept flowing and the jars kept filling because in real time before her very eyes, her miracle was in motion. I have to think that as the jars continued to fill that it had to get easier for her to have the faith and the strength and the belief and the trust in God to keep pouring. It's always the hardest to have faith at first. When obedience, trusting in God, exercising faith in God is a one-off thing in your life, then God showing up for you will seem like a one-off thing also. And every time you need God's help so desperately, trusting in him, obeying him, believing in him in a way that costs you will feel like the most painful thing ever. But faithfulness in its most simplest form is just persistent obedience. It's obedience that you can't get in the way of. It's obedience that you can't talk me out of. It's obedience that doesn't stop. It's obedience that doesn't quit. It's obedience that doesn't fold. It's obedience that does not give up or give in. It's obedience that is not dictated or determined by outcome, but by commitment. It's stubborn submission. It's tenacious trust. It's, it's determined devotion. It's obedience that persists long enough for your faith to catch momentum. That's what faithfulness is. Just as each jar brought to this woman would have been of different shapes, sizes, and capacities. Every time she was brought a new jar, this woman knew she just had to make the same old decision to keep pouring. Although your problems may be of different shapes, sizes, and levels of severity, in this new time you're having to trust God feels so different from the last time you're having to trust God. I really do believe that every time you face a new obstacle that feels so impossible, this new obstacle is really just another opportunity for you to make the same old decision to keep obeying, to keep trusting, to keep believing, to keep exercising faith in King Jesus. And I really do believe that as you continue to obey, as you continue to trust, as you continue to believe as you continue to pour that just as it would have gotten easier for this woman to act on the last thing that God told her to I believe the same will be true for you it will get easier it's gonna get easier so how long will it take for your obedience to pay off I don't know How long will it take for your 
belief to catch up with your behavior? I don't have a clue. How long will it take for you to taste the fruits of your faithfulness and hoist the rewards of your righteous actions? Could take a day. Could take a week. Could take a month. It could take the rest of your life. But this is no reason to stop obeying. Because why pout when you can pour? Why waste time complaining about your problems? Never getting closer to a solution. When you could at the very least be acting on the last thing you know God told you to do. And at least know that you are on the right track to blessing and breakthrough. You don't need me to tell you this. You probably already know this, but obviously there is only a one letter difference in the words pow and pour. One ends in a T, one ends in an R. Everybody follow me. But did you know that the letters T and R are right next to each other on a keyboard? I didn't know this. But I learned this as I was writing this sermon and my dyslexic fingers kept mistyping poor into pow. I'm actually dyslexic, I, I can say that. But it got me thinking that just as easy as it can be for me to mistype poor into pow, it can be for me to want to pow instead of poor if I don't remind myself what I'm obeying, what I'm pouring for. I'm pouring, I'm obeying because it's the last thing that God told me to do. It's that simple. That's really it. It's the last thing that God said, that's why I'm doing it. So in the meantime, as I wait on God to reward my obedience, and as I continue to pour, I'm just gonna lean on what I do know to be true. That eventually, one day, results that make no sense will be the product of obedience that still doesn't make sense to me. I love that the prophet Elijah told this woman to not only grab a few jars. I love this because this means that when this woman started pouring and when her sons first started borrowing jars from their neighbors, this means they did not know when they could stop. They were literally obeying with no end in sight. I don't have to know the next step that I can't see in order for me to take the step in front of me that I can't see. The unknown in my future doesn't have to paralyze me in fear and keep me from doing today what I do know to do. I love that this woman was told to not only grab a few jars, because when the prophet Elisha told her this, this means that the prophet Elijah was essentially saying to her, don't stop when you're satisfied. Don't stop when you feel like you've done enough, but go until you can't go no more. Do until you can't do no more. Obey until you cannot obey no more. Borrow until you cannot borrow no more. Pour until you cannot pour anymore because our human idea of good enough is never the same as God's best. I almost preached the idea of push this evening to, to, to pray until something happens, to praise until something happens, to persist until something happens, to pour until something happens. I thought that would encourage somebody. I thought that would give somebody the faith they needed to get through this next week. But the more I read this text and the more I studied this story, the more I began to realize that's not this woman's testimony. Because if this woman would have stopped pouring 
right when something started to happen, then this woman would have stopped pouring when the first few jars filled with oil. This woman would have stopped pouring when she did the math and realized she had enough jars full of oil to pay and cancel out her debt. This woman would have stopped pouring when she thought good enough and she would have missed out on God's best. But because this woman chose to obey and pour until every last jar in the neighborhood was filled, not only did this woman pay off her debt, not only did this woman have enough to live off of, but this woman made a profit. I don't know who this word has been for, but I believe I'm on assignment this Mother's Day weekend to let somebody under the sound of my voice right here and right now know that God has not asked you to push, but God has commanded you to pour, to persistently obey until revealed otherwise, to pray until revealed otherwise, to praise until revealed otherwise, to persist until revealed otherwise, to push until revealed otherwise. The aim cannot be what we want for us. The aim's got to be what God wants for us. The goal is not some objective that we desire, but the goal's got to be obedience that God desires. Because when it is, we can experience both the breakthrough and the blessing, the freedom and the fullness, the rescue and the reward, the deliverance and the destiny that God has for us. This has got to be our declaration. This has got to be our conviction. This must be the cry and the desire of our hearts that if God was the one who told me when to start, then God's the only one who can tell me when to stop. Oh, my judgment doesn't tell me when to stop. God does. My comfort doesn't tell me when to stop. God does. My preference doesn't tell me when to stop. God does. I think of this woman still has jars in front of her. I think she'd still be pouring. That's the kind of energy I'm on. That's the kind of obedience I want. I want obedience that makes the devil feel like I'm obnoxious. I want faithfulness that frustrates the hell out of hell. I want devotion that discourages demons. Oh, you cannot convince me out of what I know to be true. Results that make no sense are the product of obedience that makes no sense. So I will persistently obey until revealed otherwise, because I'm only interested in living a life that God can give me. Is there anybody in this place who knows that results that make no sense or the product of obedience that makes no sense? Who's pouring in the building? Who's praising in the building? Don't stop when you think it's been good enough, but keep going until you experience the blessing of the Lord. Make some noise for King Jesus in this church. cannot go anymore. Do until you cannot do anymore. Pour until you cannot pour anymore. Your miracle, your breakthrough, your blessing depends on it. It's going to be worth it. It may not happen how you want it to happen. It may not happen when you want it to happen, but it will happen. Just keep pouring. Just keep pouring. Say it with me. Just keep pouring. One more time. Just keep pouring. Now give God a shout of praise if you believe it to be true. With every head bowed and with every eye closed, if you needed the reminder that if God was the one who told you when to start, then he's the only one who can tell you when to stop. No one's looking around. Would you raise a hand where you are? If you needed the reminder that you're not to push, meaning you're not to stop when you feel like you've done enough, but you're to pour, you're to keep going until God says you can stop. Would you raise your hand wherever you are? Father, I thank you, Lord, for everyone who's here. But God, I believe, Lord, that some people came here tonight not knowing that they had an appointment with you, the wonderful counselor, but that's exactly what they had. God, I ask for that right now you would seal this word in their heart. That God, they may not leave here the same way they came in, 
but that God, they would leave here with the strength they need to obey, that God, they would leave here with the faith they need to persist, that God, they would leave here and do what it is you've commanded them to do until you tell them to stop. And God, I ask Lord on their behalf that they would experience whatever it is they need that only you can give them because of it. It's in the name of Jesus we pray together, amen.